I have with me Dr. Ed Zibovitz. He's on the CNO Board of Advisors. He's a TMJ surgeon. Please tell me what you do differently from other uh, oral surgeons in relative to the TMJ. Um, I think probably the, the starting point is, um, you know, with anything, is a formal diagnosis. So when we're diagnosing it, um, kind of breaking it down, I, I'm thinking, in my simple mind, I want to see does the joint work well mechanically and does, is it structurally stable? So kind of looking at the criterion to help determine that yeah. um, is you know, paramount. I'm also trying to make sure that what we do now is we're predicting what a future outcome would be like for them. So, um, so probably I would say that you know, within my box of tools that I would use, I kind of you know, customize which approach I'm going to use per patient. So right. a patient comes in, um, I'll look at all the variables, and then I'll decide which, which procedure that I feel is best versus I have one procedure sure. that works really well, and that's what I'm going to use, make everybody fit the box rather than I'll customize it so that I'll use the tools that I have to be able to address their specific needs. Can I ask you, what are, what are the options? Well, give me four or five options. What do you typically? So, you know, I know you're thinking outside the box, in other words, not just one or I two do. things. So, I mean, I think, you know, initially we're looking at is, you know, if there's a mechanical problem, I want to reestablish normal movement to the joint. Um, so I'll figure out what's going on. So my probably my workhorse procedure is a procedure called an orthocentesis. Right. Which we're basically, you know, it's... Uh, Studies-wise, it goes up against arthroscopy, or, uh, which is a, putting a, a scope into the joint and doing the work. Yeah. An arth uh, arthrocentesis is a blind arthroscopy, not putting a scope in there. So I think it's less invasive, but I can help free up adhesions, get the joint moving, get rid of inflammation. So when people have jaws that are locking up, when they have pain, um, that traditional medication or splints won't help them with, Correct. This is your first line of defense in it most is, cases, right? It is. And, and it's important when a joint's not moving, then the joint's not getting nutrition. Right. And I get concerned that what's going to happen to that if the tissues inside the joint aren't getting nutrition, then they die. Yeah. And when they die, then we end up with bigger problems. This is a little off base, but let's say I slip into a coma tomorrow and nobody moves my jaw around. What happens to me if I wake up six months later? How's my joint? So My TMJ. So probably bizarre question, but yeah. I know you know what I'm saying. So if it seems like if a, jo a joint, any joint, any orthopedic joint, and the TMJ is an orthopedic joint, right? Um, if it doesn't move, then nutrition to the intra the structures inside the joint are compromised. So you'll have lack of movement. Typically, you'll you'll develop. Uh, problems with the cartilage, adhesion formation, and then the possibility of that joint getting ankylosed, stuck, doesn't yeah. move. That's crazy, right? Yeah, so it is a problem. Use it or lose it. Right. Yeah, so, um, so an arthrocentesis, um, disc repairs? So the thought would be is, and the next thing would be is, is if I'm seeing that the meniscus out of place is leading to structural problems with the joint, yeah. condyles, we see signs that the condyles breaking down, the occlusion's changing, sure. or they start off with a malocclusion, an anterior open bite, they only contact their posterior teeth. Yeah. You know, uh, disrepair or meniscectomies and reconstruction of the, of the meniscus is, is my first choice of therapy. Reconstruction with, like, say, fat? Correct. So just fat? Harvesting fat from the abdomen, so we make a little bikini line incision, right. use that fat, and then kind of nurture the fat over a period of time. So it starts off as kind of squishy, but over time it gets condensed, compacted, and end up with like a rubbery piece of material that now sits between the fossa and the eminence, or the, the lines of fossa and the eminence, and the condyle just slides up and down it. And then a more, um, uh, next in the progression, I guess, would be what? Um, uh, rib graft, fat graft, maybe? So, so the next one would be is if I have somebody that the joint is ankylosed or stuck, yeah. or they've lost so much volume and the mandible has drifted so far back, the residual condyle is so small yeah. that if I think that I need to correct their malocclusion, improve their airway, then that little stub, a little pencil eraser of a condyle is not enough. Yeah. 
So when we look at autogenous uh, live tissue from the patient as like a rib graft, you know, when we look at those studies, um, basically the incidence of ankylosis then getting stuck is high. Right. And if you look at the shape and the size of a, of a rib and the normal shape of a condyle, it's different. it's different. And when you put a rib in, you're putting it in normally the late, the condyles wide from inside outside. When you put a rib in there, it's long. Yeah. So it doesn't really fit in the fossa as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm not a big fan of it. I feel like now, especially if I'm going to correct occlusion and re-advance mandibles that have drifted back, yeah. that I'll do a, uh, I'll design uh, virtually plan where I want the mandible to end up, mm -hmm. and I'll build a, a custom prosthesis, prosthetic jaw joint. So an artificial joint. Artificial joint, so that we can re-establish normal joint function reestablish mandibular position and okay. sometimes combine that with upper jaw surgery because that's been distorted okay. over time. And I really find and do a kind of a little cool little thing where we actually, because in order to put the joint in, we have to remove the condyle. And okay. the residual portion of the condyle is where the lateral pterygoid muscle attaches. So you actually have to cut it. I release, yeah. So I release the attachment point. So sure. before I actually release it, I'll lasso it with a suture. So, so the, you're able to reattach it to the artificial? Exactly. So the interesting okay. thing, there's no literature on that. Yeah. Even the company that, that makes the total joint, no one talks about that. <laughs> but, but the interesting thing in, is total joints, they really typically become just a, a, a hinged joint yeah. because they don't have any translation. Right. But when you reattach a lateral pterygoid muscle... You can move it as normal. So I get the patients, and the feeling is, is side-to-side -side movement, how much is enough yeah. My, and from DTR and things like that. As long as we get posterior disclusion, yeah. that's all you need. Yeah. So if I can get four millimeters of excursion and cuspid guidance and posterior disclusion, I won. You're good. Yeah. So I'm really thinking that little, little nuances of a, of a procedure, it's not just doing a total joint replacement, it's making it a functional joint by reattaching the muscle attachment. Nice. And that's been you know, something I've been doing for years, and it seemed like it made so much sense, but it's not published. Huh, interesting. It's no one else is doing. So.